Can I say it is a real pleasure to be here. Uh, my mother is from Hong Kong and uh, coming back here reminds me so much of my trips here as a kid, so thanks very much for having me today. I want to talk about an ambitious topic. How can we solve the world's trickiest problems? What I want to persuade you of today is that in order to solve our problems, we need to reframe the way in which we look at them. We ask ourselves the wrong questions, and by applying the wrong frameworks to the problems we seek to solve, we get to the wrong answers. What I want you to take away from my talk today is not Eric Knight's answers to all our problems. It's the process we need to take in our businesses, in our organisations, and in our lives to get to better answers more often. I want to start with what is not the problem. The problem is not a shortage of answers. We live in a world of seven billion people. If each of us had half an answer to all the questions we were asked, there'd be literally hundreds of billions of answers flying around the world on any single day. The problem is not finding more answers in our organisations. It's about finding the right answers. Now, reframing as that process of getting to the right answers is not itself a new idea. It's an old idea. It's evolutionary biology applied to the world of ideas. Variation and then selection. Variation and then selection as the process by which we get to better answers more often. Now, the irony is that that process is actually surprisingly rare inside our organisations. Far more common is what I describe as the magnifying glass trap, our tendency to fixate on singular ways of thinking about the world and injecting all the significance of the world into that singular idea. What I want to suggest to you is that sometimes our best answers are not things, but the process that we need to get to to get to the best answer. I want to talk to you today about three things. I want to start by giving an example of a bad answer. I then want to tell a story about a better answer, an example of one of the world's most sophisticated organisations, the US military, and how it reframed the way in which it thought about one of its answers. And finally, I want to talk about how we can be better, how we can be the sorts of leaders who get better answers more often. So I want to start here with a problem which we get wrong, but which we should get right. Some of you may have seen this at the back of the room today. It's a picture of a candle, a box of pins, and some matches. And they're sitting on a table, and the table is resting next to a wall. And the question is, how do you attach the candle to the wall and light it so that wax doesn't fall on the table? Now, the most common answer to that problem is to take the candle, attach it at some angle to the wall, and then light it so the wax would drips down the candle. The correct answer is to empty the box of pins, pin the box to the wall, and put the candle inside the box. So use the box as a candle holder. Now, most of us struggle with that problem. I, I didn't solve it, I have to be honest with you. But those who are best at getting it right are five-year-olds. Now, this puzzle was developed in the 1930s by a guy called Karl Dunker. Karl Dunker used this puzzle to describe what he called functional fixedness, our tendency to fixate on a particular way of looking at a problem, and by doing so, missing the quieter answers that sit in the background. Now, what's really interesting, though, is what conclusion you draw from that. For some people, this puzzle is a dire indictment on human civilization. If we can't solve a simple problem like the candle, the candle problem by Karl Dunker, how do we have any chance of saving the Eurozone? How do we, the global financial crisis, famine, climate change? You know, we're sort of screwed. <laughs> That's one conclusion. A better conclusion, I want to suggest, is that this puzzle isn't actually about human rationality or intelligence or education. The reason we struggle with this puzzle 
is the way in which information is presented to us. Our ability to solve a problem is directly correlated with how it is framed to us. When the puzzle is presented with the candle, the box, the pins and some matches, we're much better at solving that puzzle. How we solve a puzzle, how we process that information, directly affects our ability to get to better answers. That's why we get bad answers. We fall into the magnifying glass trap. I now want to talk about how we can get better answers. Now, I myself am not a military expert, but I want to share with you a story today which I learned speaking with people who are. Shortly after September 11 in 2001, Bob Woodward reports in his book, Bush at War, that the president kept a picture of 22 terrorists in his Oval Office desk. Every time one of those terrorists was killed by the US military or the CIA, he'd put a cross through their face. Now, the reason that was interesting is that it implied something about the way in which the president framed the war on terror. For as long as we have fought military contests, we have always framed combat as a battle of two sides, with the victor determined by force of arms. In a way, that anecdote suggested that Bush was framing the war on terror in a similar way. Winning the war was about killing the terrorists. It was a battle between people, armed combatants, in face-to-face -face combat. That's one way of thinking about the war on terror. Another way is not to focus on the terrorists, but to focus on terrorism. Not the people, but the network of people, co-opted into their particular views because of their views about Islam and the West. Now, if you frame the war in the second way, it completely changed the sort of answers you got in how you solve that problem. In the late 90s, one of the leading thinkers and strategists who began to reframe the way in which we thought about the war on terror was an Australian soldier called David Kilcullen. He was doing his PhD in uh, Indonesia, studying a group called Darul Islam. Now, Darul Islam wasn't well known in the West. He'd come across them going to a museum exhibition in Indonesia one day. He read this exhibit, which read something like this. You know, in the 1950s, uh, Darul Islam fought against the Indonesian government in an insurgency attack. But in the end, the Indonesian government won. Now, the reason that was interesting was because for Kilcullen, often when you talked about insurgency battles, it was the insurgency one, not the government. And so for him, it deserves some further thought and reflection. And he went to West Java and he started studying the community where Darul Islam had sprung up. And he started interviewing them. And he asked them, you know, what, what did he think of Darul Islam and what happened? And they confirmed what he had read. You know, Darul Islam is dead, finished an old uncertainty. But one day, as he was sitting on his porch, one evening, four figures snaked down the Garrett Valley towards his porch, two of them carrying long knives, one of them carrying a case. And when they arrived, they started asking him some questions. What is your name? What are you doing here? Why are you interested in Darul Islam? Can't you study this in a library? And when he gave his answers, they invited themselves inside. And they took their guitar out of the case, started playing some songs. And they paused to ask him some more questions. What do you think about the United States? What do you think about Muslim countries? What do you think about the Israel and Palestine conflict? And eventually, uh, in the early hours of the next morning, they left. And several days later, Kilcullen realised that the community around him completely began to change. People came up to him and they said, you know, all those answers we told you about Darul Islam being in dead insurgency, well, we were lying. It's not a dead insurgency. It's a live insurgency. It turned out that David Kilcullen was living amongst a live insurgency. Two of those people who had visited him that evening were Arabs. They'd come down to Indonesia to try and co-opt Darul Islam into the global war on terror. What Kilcullen realised was that actually the war on terror 
was more, more than just about weapons. It was about politics. Groups like Darul Islam were motivated by local political issues. They felt that they had been aggrieved politically, religiously, under the Sahara regime. And that groups like the Arabs were coming down to try and co-opt these local networks into the global war on jihad. In order to solve that problem, it wasn't just about weapons, it was about diplomacy. Now that way of thinking about the war on terror, that reframe in the way in which you analyse that problem, made its way into the US military and the leadership of Major General David Petraeus. In 2003, David Petraeus led the 101st Airborne Division of the US military into Mosul, Iraq's second largest city. But unlike the other cities, which were essentially street fights, Petraeus focused on the economic and political dimensions of that conflict. He pushed towards reviving the economic activity. He started rebuilding the bureaucracies. Uh, he set up a reconciliation tribunal in order to sort of bring some of those who had been in Saddam Hussein's regime to justice. And what that meant was that Mosul became one of the safest and most secure cities in the whole theatre of the war. In the years that passed, he developed Field Manual 3-24 on counterinsurgency, which began to reframe the DNA of the US military and how they began to think about this problem. And in early 2007, he was appointed Major General, Commanding General of Multinational Forces in Iraq. That was significant because it allowed him to take advantage of something known as the Anbar Awakening. Sunni, Sheikh, tribal leaders began to align themselves with the United States rather than with the Al-Qaeda militants. Now that wasn't something that Petraeus had created, but by realising that the conflict was essentially a political conflict in some instances, he was able to focus on that issue and drive it towards de-escalating the violence inside Iraq. It wasn't the only way in which he solved that problem, it wasn't the only solution to apply equally in all places, but by focusing on the political dimensions of the conflict, he was able to move to a peace quicker. So I've talked about two things. I've talked about why we get bad answers. We focus on the magnifying glass trap. We focus on the wrong things. I talked about how we get better answers by reframing the frameworks that we apply in order to solve the problems that we face. I want to finish by how we can be better, how we can be the sorts of people who get better answers more often. In 1953, Isaiah Berlin, British philosopher, wrote an essay called The Hedgehog and the Fox. Now, it wasn't his longest essay, it wasn't his most famous essay. But in that essay, he opened with a fragment of Greek poetry. The fox knows many things, but the hedgehog knows one big thing. Now, the essay went on to be a sort of uh, literary criticism of Tolstoy's view of history. But in that opening part of the essay, Berlin essentially set up two sorts of people. Hedgehogs were the romantic heroes of history. They were people who had singular ideas about how the world worked, and they injected all the significance of the world into that singular idea. Foxes, by contrast, were life's natural sceptics. They constantly doubted themselves. They never quite knew if they were on the right answer. And they were always looking to adapt their thinking till they got to better answers. Now, Berlin didn't make a judgement as to which was better or worse. But many decades later, the US political scientist, Philip Tetlock, did a study of business and political leaders, those who were hedgehogs, and those who were foxes. What he discovered was quite surprising. Hedgehogs were those who were convinced that they were right. But over time, their predictions of the future showed that they turned out to be often quite wrong. Foxes, by contrast, always doubted themselves. But in that willingness to adapt, they turned out to be right more often. How do we solve the world's trickiest problems. Perhaps there is a lesson in Berlin's essay for how we should lead our businesses and our organisations in a chaotic and rapidly changing world. We live in an age of uncertainty, and yet for some organisations, that uncertainty is more an opportunity 
then it is a curse. It is a curse if we feel compelled to match that uncertainty with the equal and opposite emotion. Absolute certainty. Strategic planning always done from the top down rather than the bottom up. Workforce management always done from the centre rather than engaging the business units. A CEO's vision always crafted rigidly rather than adaptively. But an age of uncertainty is an opportunity if we realise that our best answers arrive by iteration and over time. Take Google, for example. Google's 20% time policy, the freedom that it gives its employees to pursue any idea that it wants, one in every five days, is a direct investment in chaos. What matters is not that every idea is right, but that if it is wrong, it fails early and is iterated often. Failure, in a way, becomes the secret to success. It builds the platform upon which our future prosperity and our best ideas come. Many years after the war in Iraq, I interviewed John Nagel, who was a retired lieutenant colonel in the US military, how he knew that by reframing the war on terror, from focusing on the terrorists to focusing on terrorism, from focusing on the people to focusing on the networks, that he knew he was right, that he was actually going to solve the problem. His answer surprised me. We didn't know, he said. We could have been wrong. And if we were wrong, we would have had to change our strategy. Reframing wasn't always about being right. It was about knowing when you were wrong and having the humility to adapt. The side that learns fastest, he said, is the side that wins. Thank you.